Hello, my name is Phil Price. I'm the priest in charge of the Draycott and Len Valley Benefice. And this is my sermon for the 26th of November. Uh, I'm just going to pray for us as we start. Lord God, we thank you so much for the gift of your word. As we come to reflect on it now, we pray that you may challenge us, but also encourage us and build us up. Amen. I wonder if you play Whamageddon. If you haven't come across it before, it's a game that's played during the 24 days before Christmas Eve, in which players try to avoid hearing Last Christmas by Wham between the 1st of December and the 24th of December. If a player hears the song between those days, they are out of the game and they have to post hashtag Whamageddon on social media to indicate that they have lost. Today is the last Sunday before Advent, if you're watching as it goes live. Uh, so if you want to play this year, you have until Thursday to listen to it as many times as you like to get your Wham! fix before we get into Advent. Uh, the reason I'm telling you all this now is that I think Last Christmas by Wham! is potentially a really good mechanism for remembering what Ezekiel 34 uh, is all about. Uh, Ezekiel 34 is uh, where our reading for today in the lectionary comes from. Uh, it's quite a long reading, uh, so I'm going to shake things up a little bit. I'm not going to read the passage in one go in advance as I usually do. Uh, instead, I'm going to read chunks of the passage as we go through. Hopefully that will break it up a little bit and allow us to examine uh, different parts of what's going on as they come up. So I'm sure everyone knows uh, the first two lines of Last Christmas by Wham are Last Christmas I gave you my heart, but the very next day you gave it away. This is a song about someone who trusted someone but was betrayed by that person. And it's a song written to the person that has betrayed them. In Ezekiel 34, God is addressing a group of people who've betrayed him. A group of people who he trusted with something very special, but they turned their back on him. Ezekiel 34 is a prophecy delivered through the prophet Ezekiel, obviously, uh, which God prefaces with the words, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. This isn't about literal shepherds. God isn't calling down judgment on the farming industry. The word shepherds was a well-known metaphor, not just in Israel, but in all the nations around them as well. When God refers to the shepherds here, he's referring to all of those in leadership authority positions. Today, we've retained this idea of shepherds in church, where the vicar is sometimes referred to as the shepherd. And I myself often find myself referring uh, to the people in my care as my flock. However, in its original context, the idea of shepherds is much broader than just religious leadership. Yes, the Levite priests would have been included in this group of shepherds that God is addressing, but so too would be the king of Israel, along with all of his officers and the whole leadership structure. The shepherds that are about to get a real rollicking are basically anyone who God has given any degree of power and influence to. So what is it that God's got issue with, with the shepherds of Israel? Well, that's what the first 10 verses of Ezekiel 34 are dealing with, and I'm going to read them to you now. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of their flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourself with the wool and slaughter the choice elements but you do not take care of the flock. You've not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You've not brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. You've not, you have ruled them harshly and brutally, so they are scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered all over the mountain on an every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd, and so has been plundered, 
and has become food for all the wild animals. And because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than for my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord said. I am against the shepherds and I will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. God is angry with the shepherds of Israel because he charged them with looking after his flock, his people. The point of leaders and those in authority is that they're meant to look after the people that they are put in authority over. But rather than looking after them, rather than caring for God's people, the shepherds of Israel exploited them. They feathered their own nests on the backs of the people of Israel. They led them astray and they got rich and fat in the process. So if we were to summarise those first 10 verses um, of Ezekiel 34 in the style of Wham, uh, it might go something like this. Last Christmas, I gave you my flock, but the very next day, you stole the wool, ate the juiciest looking ones and left the rest to die. It's not as catchy as the original, but it's punchier and it still has resonance today. Certainly in the church, those of us in positions of responsibility need to remember that we are here to care for those we've been given authority over. All bishops, vicars, priests of charge, curates, wardens, readers, PCC members, school, Sunday school leaders, anybody with a position of authority in the church needs to remember that we are accountable to God for what we do in that position. But this applies much wider than church. With the ongoing COVID-19 inquiry, uh, keeping that period of all our lives fresh in our minds, Partygate I know it's lazy and I know I talk about it a lot, but it's the perfect contemporary example of what these shepherds were doing in Israel. It's a perfect, brilliant example of shepherds abandoning their flocks, what that looks like. I don't want to labour the point because we all know what happened there and I'm not about making cheap political points and I'm not being party political. But what happened was those charged with making the rules to keep everyone safe were breaking the rules themselves, making others stay at home to stop the spread of the virus, whilst they were partying and enjoying themselves in Downing Street. And I only mention that because it's a really good illustration of what we're talking about at a national level. But the danger of dwelling on Partygate too much is that it allows us to simply get angry at the shepherds who haven't looked after us, without being challenged to think about the fact that actually each one of us is a shepherd in a way and whilst many of us will be very good shepherds and for the most part I think we will be, but because we are human because we are fallen we will all have peoples in our lives that we are charged to look after but don't always manage to do that perfectly if you're a parent then you're a shepherd to your children and I'm sure you are a good parent and parents need to hear that they are good parents because it's hard work and they need to be encouraged. But even the best parents in the world get exasperated with their children from time to time. If you're uh, looking after older parents, then in a way you're a shepherd to your parents. As they get older, they'll need more care and looking after. And at some point they may need you to start making choices on their behalf, ensuring that they're looked after and cared for properly. And when you do that, I know you do that with love, but inevitably it will lead to stress and sleepless nights. And there will be times in that hardness when you get fed up. And when you get fed up, maybe you will tell someone about that, either your parents or someone else. If you are at work and you line manage someone, then you are a shepherd to the people you are in charge of. These people look up to you and need your input to grow and develop in their jobs. If you lead a community group, then you're in a place to look after the members of that group. And even if none of what I've said applies to you, if you're in church, then you're part of the bride of Christ and that makes you a shepherd. We all have a role in the church. 
we all have a responsibility within the church to look after each other and to bring in and welcome people from outside the church to bring in those lost sheep those who've been scattered as our passage talked about i know i'm priest in charge i have particular responsibility for overseeing this but we're all responsible for the pastoral care in this benefit it's my job to try and do my share of the care and it's my job to equip us all to care for each other and there are times i know this and i'm not saying it's not true but there are times when people need a dog collar when they need the vicar or a priest to see them but that doesn't mean that i or barbara are the only people charged with looking after the people in our pews and in our benefice it's incumbent on all of us uh, to play our part so God had some very scathing words for the shepherds of Israel. And I believe he will have some equally scathing words for some people in the world today who are in positions of authority and are meant to be looking after those under their care. But there is also a challenge for all of us to look at these words and read these warnings and see them as a challenge to think about the areas of our lives where we are called to be shepherds, to ask ourselves, how can we be more faithful as shepherds than those people who God was telling off in our passage. It's really important to say all of this, uh, but Ezekiel 34 is not all doom and gloom. It's not all about the failure of shepherds. It goes on. I'm reading you now verses 11 to 16. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they are scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them, pasture them, pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in the settlements in the land. I will tend them in good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. They will lie down in good grazing land, and they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. God is done with the bad shepherds of Israel. He's going to come and sort it out himself. Part of the reason uh, this week is Christ the King and it's all about Jesus uh, coming again. Um, so it's an odd that I've chosen to preach on the Old Testament reading rather than the Gospel reading. But part of the reason that I chose to do that is because I believe that many of us will be familiar with John 10 where Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd. But I don't know how many of us realise quite how strong that imagery that Jesus uses was in the Old Testament as well as the New. It's not new to John. Jesus, when he calls himself the good shepherd, is referencing this passage, Psalm 39, and so many others. Uh, and as we think of Christ the King, the day when Jesus comes again, I think it's good to uh, read the Old Testament and read this description of the Good Shepherd, who is the one we celebrate on Christ the King. The Trinity is a very complex doctrine, with God both being both a single deity and three distinct persons. Uh, and with the doctrine of the Trinity in mind, I think it's entirely possible that the next line of Last Christmas from Wham does work uh, for Ezekiel 34. Uh, as you may remember, because last Christmas I gave you my heart, the very next day you gave it away. But this year, to save me from tears, I'll give it to someone special. I think because of the nature of Trinity, that does work. But given the emphasis of our passage, those second two lines uh, need changing slightly. Uh, so in my version, it says, this year, to save me from tears, I'll do it myself. Having seen his people abandoned and abused by their leaders, God is going to step in and care for them himself. And we have that beautiful passage that we just read about what that looks like. As we come to a close, I'm not going to try and expand on that vision 
of the Good Shepherd. I think it's beautiful and it speaks for itself. But I do want to draw out three really quick and simple thoughts about how this all fits together to give us encouragement uh, at the end of our church year. The new church year starts next week with the first Sunday of Advent. So at the end um, of the church year, as we reflect on Christ the King, Christ the Good Shepherd, I think it's worth remembering. Uh, firstly, if we have been betrayed by those in authority over us, then this passage reminds us that God does care for us. And when we feel abandoned and betrayed, we can know there is a good shepherd who we can trust. Secondly, if we're aware of the relationships in our lives where we need to act like good shepherds, extending care and love to those who are vulnerable, then we can look to Jesus, the good shepherd, who is the perfect example for us to follow. And thirdly, thinking about those relationships where we are shepherds. It can often become painfully obvious to us at times when we fall short of what is expected of us. I'm aware that I don't always get it right as your vicar, and we will all get things wrong uh, in relationships with people that we are caring for. When we come face to face with our failures and the times we mess up, we can know there is another shepherd who works over us. Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, won't mess up when we do because he loves his flock even more than we do. So even when we mess up, we can hand our flocks over to Jesus and know that he will care for them. So when we get into Advent, I don't know whether you'll be playing Whamageddon. And if you are, I don't know how long you will last before you hear that song. But when you do hear it at the beginning of December, or maybe you'll make it to Christmas Eve, when you do hear it, I just wonder if now it could be for us a reminder of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who is coming to care for his people. I've changed the words and my version doesn't rhyme, doesn't fit the music, it doesn't scan. But if I read you my version of the first verse, then maybe, maybe we can make last Christmas another one of many pieces of Christmas music that when we hear it, it reminds us of the true meaning of Christmas. So my version goes like this. Last Christmas, I gave you my flock, but the very next day, you stole the wool, ate the juiciest looking ones and left the rest to die. This year, to save me from tears, I'll do it again. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that you love us and you care for us. Thank you that you are the good shepherd. Thank you that you sent Jesus and he came to care for us, to look after us and to bring the scattered together again. We pray as we enter Advent and Christmas time that you may give us eyes and ears to see and hear what Jesus says to us that we may never forget that he is the good shepherd, the over shepherd. Help us to be shepherds when you call us. Help us to be sheep when you call us to be that too. Amen.